praise you right now. Praise your holy name. God, we thank you for who you are, what you've done in our lives. Father, that even if you didn't do more, that what you've already done is enough. God, let that be where my worship comes from, is that what you have already done is enough. You satisfy every need in my life, Father God. Thank you, Jesus. You overflow my cup. I never need no want. You're enough. You're a lamp unto
Thank you, Father. I was having a conversation with a guy here not too long ago about starting another rodeo company and and um, come around to I said well you got to figure out are you done are you finished because here's what I know God doesn't start something that he doesn't finish and it boils down to what is right here in between our ears are we done because he'll finish what he starts you just have to figure out are you done because he's enough to see things through but he's not going to do it for us. And I heard it as loud as I heard anything. This morning, are you done? Doesn't matter the situations and the circumstances that are going on or coming against you, but are you done? Or are you? You believe in that he's going to finish what he starts. Father, we come to you this morning. And I thank you that you're never done. Lord, I pray that there be a hope that begins to stir on the inside of us. That begins to agitate us. that begins to agitate that it begins to interrupt our everyday lives begins to interrupt our thoughts Lord I pray that those dreams and those visions began to stir us and agitate us Father, I thank you this morning for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. All right. Well, anyway, if you've got your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 24. The title of this is Time to Excel. It's Time to Excel. And in Daniel chapter 11, in verse 32 we find a scripture that says, those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery, but the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Now here's the thing. It says, those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery. The Word of God tells us in Ephesians that we war not with flesh and blood but against the prince powers of the air, right? In, in, in the heavenly places that are always at war with us, okay? And so it says, those who do wickedly against the covenant. And I looked that word wickedly up and it means to be wrong, violate, or depart, the covenant, those who are wrong about the covenant, those who uh, violate the covenant. God's covenant is God's covenant. Listen, Daniel is seeing a day when wickedness will arise and desecrate the sanctuary and set up an abomination to cause desolation. That's what Daniel's looking at. That's what Daniel is having a dream about. And, he, and, he, and God begins to interpret this for him. And, uh, and God shows him that this is for the appointed time. But what I want you to look at is it says, those who do wickedly against the covenant, 
he shall corrupt. What also it says an antichrist spirit has gone out from the day Jesus left. There were several Jesuses here when Jesus was here. <laughs> Saying they were the Messiah. Come on. And so you've always have you always have this wicked influence trying to peddle the wrong covenant. Come on, are y'all with me? See, good people, there's good people. And it says, with smooth words, he will turn to godliness. Listen, we, we, when we see that word wickedly, we always think of the murderers, the rapists, the child abusers. No, that's not. He's talking about people who are just wrong, who are religious, they're just wrong. Come on, are y'all with me? Good people who are wrong. Departing from the God's statutes and His ways. That's what he's talking about. There was a Anicus, a Syrian king. He declared an edict. It's a force of law. And this is what Daniel was looking at. That sought to unite all the people of his kingdom in religion, law, and custom. <laughs> the funny thing about that is, is it's okay to be religious and woke, <laughs> but not to keep the covenant of the living God. Because what he here's what he set up. He, <clears throat> he issued... Uh, regulations against observing the Sabbath from practicing circumcision and from keeping all food laws. See, smooth words, smooth words to come against God's covenant. And after that, it's funny, these smooth words. Women's health care. Come on, that's smooth words. Sounds good, doesn't it? Women's health care. Uh, then you've got the other smooth word. What's it called? Gender reaffirming. Come on, are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And we've got toxic masculinity. Guilty. <laughs> Come on, y'all y'all hear what y'all listen, this ain't nothing new. And it's all set up an abomination to to discredit the covenant. Come on. To get us being religious but wrong about the covenant. Are y'all with me? And here's what this king set up. Then came the erection of the altar of the Greek god Zeus over the altar of the burnt offering in the temple. Come on. Setting up the abomination of desolation that Daniel seen. And... How many of y'all remember studying about the Greek gods? I mean, we did it in junior high. But I didn't remember none of the... Come on, y'all. I had to look up Zeus. Zeus was considered the father of all other gods. And you know what's crazy about Zeus? Zeus. He was gender confused. He had an identity crisis. He would turn himself into a bull to rape. Come on. This is what they... He had a womb that 
one of his wives didn't birth one of his kids, he did. Woke ain't new. Woke been around a while. Zeus wasn't nothing more than an adulterer, a fornicator, and a rapist, and a child abuser. And this was the father of all other gods. And this Syrian king set him up over, come on, the temple of God to desecrate, to bring desolation. See, once you desecrate and are wrong about the covenant and you just become religious, then comes the destruction. Come on. Y'all seeing this? What we're going through is not new. It just looks better because we're more advanced. Oh, man. Then in 70 AD, the Romans destroyed the temple, which Daniel talked about in chapter 12. And Jesus talked about it in Matthew and Mark. When you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, let's turn to Matthew 24. Look in verse 4. Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pains. Now, you want to talk about smooth words here. It says there's going to be many that come and say I'm the Christ. And Jesus tells us real plain in verse 6, do not be frightened at this. Don't be frightened at all of this that's going on. For nations and kingdoms, this is only the birth pains. Look at verse 12. But because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. And it says in verse 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation which was spoken of through Daniel, the prophet, standing in the holy place, and it says, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, just stop for a minute because we've gotten real good and we got hung up on the fleeing part. That's where we went to in this scripture and that's where we hung our hat on the fleeing part, on the great escape part, on the rapture part, on the let's get the heck out of Dodge part. But we didn't realize that there's something for us to do. One, don't be frightened. And here's the deal. When you see all these things, when you hear the wars about wars, when you see kingdoms coming against each other, when you see the abomination, and when you see all that, it says, don't be frightened. And if we get frightened, guess what? We're listening to the wrong smooth talker. Come on. But Jesus plainly and very clearly, he says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a witness. See, in the midst 
of lawlessness. During a time of confusion of right and wrong. Are y'all with me? I'm just trying to connect a few dots here. When the moral compass and the and and the and when you're seeing there's no there's an absence of absolute truth. An absence of absolute truth. We have been at an absence of absolute truth for well over a hundred years now. Well over. When you see that, it says this gospel shall be preached. That's our job. Is to excel. To do great exploits. Come on. See, believers who know their God, believers who know Jesus are going to be declaring His rule and sovereignty, come on, right here on this earth in the midst of all this confusion. And we're going to just keep getting brighter and brighter and brighter. Come on. We're going to keep walking in more and more of the power of the Holy Spirit. And let me just say this. The more Holy Spirit you've got in you, the more you're going to be persecuted, mocked. Come on. And the more you're going to be blessed for it. Oh, man. Come on, a people who hold to the covenant of life through Christ. That's very important as believers that we understand the covenant of life. And it's not living under religious rules of tradition and doctrines. You got to hear me. And it's not living under bad, Paul called it traditions of men and doctrines of demons. That's what he called it. Because what that is is smooth words, come on, that get you wrong about the covenant of God. And that's what begins to cause death in your life and not life. There should have been a lot more amens on that. See, religious law and traditions and doctrines produces nothing but death that's all it produces is death come on are y'all with me but the covenant that came in through God's spirit is Jesus and that brings life it brings freedom it was for freedom that he set you free and that's where the glory never fades it never fades it just gets brighter Come on. Romans 5, chapter 12. Let's plug in a few scriptures here because you you got to see this. You got to see it to believe it. (laughs) Yeah. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into, into the world and death through through sin it is it, try not to get bogged down but just kind of sort through this a little bit it says therefore just as just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin and so death spread to all men because all sin for until the law sin was in the world but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But look here. See, Adam and Eve disobeyed a direct command. And sin came in. Now, we didn't sin in their likeness before Moses because 
there was no target. Does that make sense? There was nothing to aim at. There was nothing to tell us this was wrong. In the Bible, you always see when it says, and men did what was right in their own eyes. That's what caused them to miss the mark. Come on, I, I want this to be like a light bulb goes off. And when we started teaching choice and preference to our kids instead of absolute truth, it's every man doing right in his own eyes. That is so we can miss the mark. So that we can't have life, but it produces death. Come on, is anybody in here listening to what I'm saying? And so if we don't take over and start taking charge of what our kids are hearing and what they're listening to, and let me tell you something, their belief system is going to be infected with desolation and desecration. And we got a government that is allowing desecration to our kids from which way God made them. And they're starting to cut stuff off that God put there for a reason. Now, I don't know which road you want to walk down, but I don't want my kids and grandkids walking down that road. <laughs> oh. Let me just, for, for anybody new here, that doesn't understand me. When you push me, I'm pushing back. Come on, y'all hearing what I'm saying? And let me tell you something. The world is pushing on us as believers. And if we don't push back and get a set, can I say that? And push back then they're just going to roll right over us and we're just going to fade right into the, come on. And I just refuse to go into the night quietly. My goal and my job is to read this word and give you something to aim at. Because God came and said, here's, here's where I want you to hit. And this is life. This produces death. This is the way in which you can go. This is my covenant. And if you do it, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I will finish what I started in you. Regardless of how bad and how ignorant they get, you will do what you're called to do. Come on, are y'all with me? See, we had no mark to shoot for. Now, I want to read Romans 5, 13 out of the message. It says, you know the story of Adam landed us in the dilemma we're in. First sin, then death. And no one exempt from either sin or death. That sin disturbed relations with God in everything and everyone by the extent of the disturbance was not clear until God spelled it out in detail to Moses. The law. Adultery, fornication, come on. Till God spelled it out in detail to Moses. So death, this huge abyss separated us from God, dominated the landscape from Adam to Moses. Even those who didn't sin precisely as Adam did, 
but disobey by disobeying a specific command of God still had to experience this termination of life, this separation from God, but Adam, who got us into this, also the second Adam will get us out of it. Come on, are y'all hearing? Jesus was the second Adam. And what he did on the cross bridged the a gap. It put a, a, it put a bridge over the abyss so that we could get back to God, not be separated so that we'll know life. Because without God, there is no life. Come on. That's why we struggle. That's why we struggle in relationships. That's why we struggle on our jobs. That's why we struggle in finances. That's why we str- Come on. Human nature was impacted by Adam and Eve missing the mark. So we are born missing the mark. We're born because we didn't... The law... The commandments showed us where we missed it. That's why they're so important. Jesus didn't nullify them. He fulfilled them for us. That's the gap. We couldn't, when you start putting law on people, they can't live up to that. God knew that. But he had to establish law first so that we could, come on, get back and live under, we're clothed in Jesus' righteousness. Come on. Hitting the mark so we can get back to God so he can show us what life really is. When he put the cherubims in front of the tree of life, remember that in Genesis? When they sinned, he put the cherubims in front of the tree of life so that we wouldn't, li- we wouldn't go grab the fruit. If he wouldn't have guarded that tree, Adam and Eve would still be alive today, but in a frozen state of condemnation and guilt. What? Yeah, that's how they got to life. They would go to the tree of life, take a bite, and it would renew their mortal flesh. Does that make sense? (laughs) Yeah. They weren't made to die. But when they went to the tree of good and evil, and then they experienced evil, it brought death. Come on, does that make sense? God guarded the tree of life, not the tree of evil, of good and evil. They knew good, but they never experienced evil. Come on. Jesus is the way back to life. Come on. See, we have access through Jesus now to hit the mark. To hit the mark. We can all hit it. And we do it through Jesus Christ. And then therefore, because we have access to forgiveness, and so therefore, we got access to the kingdom of God and life. That's how when we know our God, we can preach the gospel about the kingdom of God that says now we can hit the mark. It's not on my righteousness. Come on. I don't have to jump through hoops. I don't have to light all these candles. I don't have to do all this law to hit the mark. And nobody but an enemy of the kingdom of God wants you trying to jump through all these hoops through smooth words. Come on. Keep you so occupied that you can't hit the mark. Does it does any of that make sense? Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm not sure you're convinced. 
So let's look. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verse 1. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need as some letters of condemnation, accommodation? In other words, do we need endorsements or credentials? That's what he's talking about. Letters. I never understood that. I grew up in a denomination that if you jump ship, went to another ship, you moved your letter. What, what is that? I mean, that's like... <laughs> What's that letter look like? I, I'm just saying, we do these things... Listen, it is hilarious. I remember as a little kid standing in front of the pulpit and everybody voting if we could be in the church. Wow. <laughs> didn't know nothing about us. <laughs> yeah, and didn't know nothing about us. We partied on Saturday night and we went to church on Sunday. If they'd have known that part, they wouldn't all went, Yay. But nay, come on, that's how ridiculous this is. We want to know where it happened. This is, I'm just trying to make this relevant that we all understand that nothing's changed. The devil has no new tactics, but he has a way of dragging us backwards and being wrong and on the wrong side of the covenant of God. Are y'all with me? Look what he said. Or do we need as some letters of commendation to you or from you? You are our letter written in our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ. See, when we are free, Man, y'all hear me. When we are free and walking and trying to hit the mark, it just gets brighter, brighter, and brighter. Does that make sense? You are our letter. You are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit. See, the spirit, the covenant, the new covenant of Jesus Christ is a spirit of life. It's not a letter of death. The letter of the law brought death. But the spirit brought life. Oh, man. Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. And such confidence we have through Christ towards God, towards the mark. We have this confidence. It's not in ourselves. It's in Christ. So we don't have to jump through all these religious doctrinal hoops to hit the mark. Come on. Does that make sense? Oh, man. I know. I just sat on the couch going, God, this is a... Can't wait to preach it. I'm telling you. Verse 5. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. Oh, man who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, come on, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones came with glory, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face fading as it was, how shall the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? We have a glory that came in with Jesus that never fades. 
It just gets brighter and brighter because it says we're going from glory to glory to glory. How many times have you seen people get meaner and meaner in the church? Because the letter of the law is bringing death. Come on. And it fades away. And so they get more meaner. <laughs> but the glory of a new covenant gets brighter and brighter and brighter. I know. See, what had glory in this case has no glory on account of the glory that surpasses it. See, the law had glory. Man, this is pointing us back. But it was fading away. And in the natural, when Moses came down with it, showing us how to get back to life, come on, it was on his face. But that glory was fading away. But now when Jesus came it just keeps getting brighter and brighter. Does that make sense? See, this is how Daniel was able to say and look into our day and say the people who know their God will do great exploits. They will excel. They will take action, not go and flee and hide in the mountains. Come on, are y'all with me? but stand right in the middle of all the persecution just as Jesus did doing all the miracles. Come on. Even when they tried to kill him and throw him off the cliff, he just walked right through them. That's where we're headed. <laughs> this is so important. See, the problem we have with, listen, John 14. The saddest thing to me is that people in America will tell you, yeah, I love God, but they just don't know Him. Everybody loves God. Who in here don't love God? Raise your hand. They say, yeah, ain't nobody. You can go in a grocery store. You love God? Oh, yeah, I love God. Do you know him? Well, uh, yeah, well, I know he's a God of love. <laughs> right? Y'all have heard all that. But they don't know him. So they can't excel in life. What did Paul tell Timothy? They're holding to a form of godliness. But they're denying the power of. Come on. See, that's what religion and doctrine does. And all that's fading away. John 14, 12 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do shall he do also. Greater works than these shall he do because I go to the Father and whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now, who wants to debate that? I don't want to debate that because I'm believing that. Why? Because Jesus said it. If Jesus said it, I don't have to debate it. Whether it went out in the past, whether, oh, that's just for the disciples and all those guys. Well, I'm a disciple. Come on. And it says... He who believes. I'm a he who. He didn't say if you guys, just you guys, Peter, Paul, James, John, Luke, Mark, Mark if y'all will believe this, when you die, everybody will read about this. Jesus had this great 
innate way of looking past to us and including us into everything. Now let me take it one step further back. God went all the way back, come on, to Abraham, said your descendants will be like the sands of the seashore and included us in that. And if you want to go on further back than that, we can all go on back to the garden. And God included us. <laughs> Come on. You are always on his mind. You are always on my mind. Listen. It just works. See, the problem we have with that scripture right there is the natural. See, the problem we have with that scripture is our human nature. You need to write that down. The problem with most scripture in the Bible that is written in red the problem with it is our human nature. Because our human nature is influenced by a worldly dialogue that is influenced by satanic forces. Come on, I know, I know. But you got to stay with me on this. When Jesus said, greater works you will do than I have done... Where does your inner dialogue go to? Is it what's in here going, yes? Or is it going, oh, no? <laughs> does it make you take a step back? Look. I've been so blessed by God in, in what we do in the industry of rodeo to hang out with and be friends with some world champions and hang around some world champions and actually get to see and know these guys because let me tell you something, their inner dialogue is totally different than the guy who can't, come on, get out of the practice pen. One of my friends that won the world, before he was getting in the PRCA, the back of his chaps read the NFR kid. And the thing we don't like about those kind of guys is because sometimes that inner dialogue comes out of them and it sounds like cockiness. Come on, y'all ain't hearing what I'm saying. And so we step back and we're just like, oh, he just he's so full of himself. No, his inner dialogue's different from yours. Don't knock it. Are, are y'all with me in here? If you're going to be a successful businessman, your inner dialogue better be different from everybody else's. Because what's in the natural is going to always be trying to change your situation and your circumstance. If you think you're going to be a Christian businessman and the devil's going to just let you walk into success, you got another thing coming. You better change the inner dialogue. Come on. And you better change your perspective if you're going to do greater things than he done. Jesus never was a Christian businessman. Come on, are y'all with me? Jesus never was a professional basketball player. 
Jesus never was. Come on, are y'all hearing what I'm saying here? But he says, greater works you'll do than I've done. Because I'm going to the Father and I'm going to be that Christian businessman through you. I'm going to be that contestant through you. I'm going to be that, come on, carpenter through you. I'm going to be that pipe fitter through you. I'm going to be that welder through you. Now we're going to watch this thing. Come on, is anybody in here? I'm going to be that mom. I'm going to be that stay-at-home mom that is going to train up her child in the way she should go. In the midst of a time when women ought to be uh, have careers. When the pressure, come on. I'm going to be the mom that instills absolute truth. Oh, man. Greater works. Let me let's say let's say this. Faith here faith is actively resisting the devil. When Destin began to stand up there and tell you how listen, that's real life. And before, he didn't resist. But he finally had enough, enough. And he began to actively resist and refuse the devil. You have got to actively refuse and resist the devil because he's always going to be trying to put on you what you're seeing in the natural. Well, this sickness is going around. Well, this is going around. Well, you got to have a pill for this. You got to do. Uh, is anybody hearing me? Every sickness and disease is from the devil. I will tell you that. I will stand by it. You can see it in God's word. And I'm telling you right now resist and refuse him. Get violent with that. Get in your car. Go for a drive. Come out to the ranch. Get in the middle of the pasture and scream if you have to. But by cracky, get violent. Put your faith into action. Go kick a few weeds. Come kick a puppy. I'll hold Ziggy down. You can come kick him. <laughs> There's a whole story behind that. <laughs> yeah. But get violent at the devil and tell him you ain't staying here. <laughs> this is so important because everything in our life that we see, that our eyes and ears hear, what we feel, what we touch, what we taste, come on, what we smell, this is all noise from the natural realm that influence us. Come on, this this outside dialogue. You can't go by your feelings. You can't go by what you see or what you hear. Because I'm telling you, there's so many things out there that's getting in our ears that when it goes in our ears, it begins to influence the inner dialogue. Oh, I am sick. Oh, I got those symptoms. Quit Googling your symptoms. Quit Googling it. <laughs> Do I need to say that again? Yes. Quit Googling. 
Google a promise. Google the word. If you go Google something, Google I got the mind of Christ. Come on, man. Do I need to go there? I am the righteousness of Christ. He will never leave me nor forsake me. Oh, man. I am healed, delivered, set free. Come on. He left his peace. Come on. (laughs) Our inner dialogue has to know God and not be drowned out by the human nature. That's it's so important that we know our God. Listen, faith, faith works off the inner dialogue, not on this what's out here. You don't have to see it. Are y'all hearing me? You don't have to see it. That's why faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Okay? Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, not those, the things that aren't seen. Come on. Faith works off the inner dialogue, not what's going on out here. Let me show you. Mark chapter 9. This is so good. This happens. Oh, man. This happens all the time to us and we back up. Mark chapter 9, verse 14. And when they came back to the disciples, Jesus and a couple of others, they saw a large crowd around them, some scribes arguing with them. Of course, scribes are going to argue. What are scribes? Scribes are the guys that wrote the laws down. God gave them ten commandments. You know how many more man came up with? Six hundred and something that they all were trying to live by. Can't wash your hands. You can't do it. They had all these dumb things. Can't untie your ox. You can't. See, that's man. And now here's these religious leaders arguing with them. And immediately when the entire crowd saw him, they were amazed and began running up to greet him. And he asked them, what are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought you my son, possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it dashes him to the ground, and he foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth. Oh, man, I'm out on that one. And stiffens out. (laughs) Oh, man. And I told your disciples, cast it out. And they could not do it. And he answered them and said, O oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? And notice what he says. Where does your belief system start? On the inside of you. He says, O oh, unbelieving. Come on, when are you going to get this in here? When are you going to get this inner dialogue lined out? Because all the disciples were doing was looking at the human nature side of this problem. Look what, it, look what happens. You're going to love this. I did. <laughs> you may not, but I did. How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when he saw him... Look what, look what happens. And they brought the boy to him. And when he saw him, who he? No, when the demon on the inside saw Jesus. When he <laughs> I love this. Immediately. The spirit threw him into a convulsion and falling to the ground, he began rolling about and foaming at the mouth. And he asked his father, 
How long has this been happening? Look, look where we are. Look where we are. Because I grew up in a denomination that when they seen this kind of stuff, the hair raised up on the back of their neck and they're out of here. I'm just trying to be transparent with you. And they didn't know. Ooh, we don't know what to do with that. Why? Because they had no inner dialogue with the Father to understand what was really happening. Jesus was like, how long has this been going on? He wasn't even stunned. What he was stunned at is how long this has been happening. How, how long has this been going on? And I could just, you can feel the compassion for this young man having to put up with a devil that we have the authority to cast out. Jesus said to him, <laughs> he said from childhood, and it has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Jesus didn't have pity. He had compassion. Look what he says. Look what Jesus said. If you can. If you can. Can you? Come on, what's your inner dialogue? Look what he says. If you can, all things are possible to him who believes. What's going on here? Do you believe it? Or do you just dismiss it as, oh, I can't never, I don't know if I'll ever be that good, or I don't know. What are you settling for? Come on. Or, listen, we settle for so, we settle because we don't want to give something up. Jesus says, immediately the boy's father cried out and began saying, I do believe, but help my unbelief. Come on, this is, this is the inner dialogue that's going on. I do believe, but help my unbelief. That that's not settled on the inside of me yet, I need that worked on too. Jesus said... Here's what's amazing. Jesus is like, okay, good enough. I can work with that. Jesus said, I'll work with that. Look what he did. <laughs> and Jesus saw the crowd was rapidly gathering. He rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter him again. And after crying out and throwing him into terrible convulsions, he came out. Look what the demon did still. He still trying to influence what Jesus was seeing and what the Father was seeing. Still trying to influence the human nature side. Come on, are y'all with me? Because that's what's always going to be impacted by you hitting the mark. If you don't change the inner dialogue 
that's on the inside of you to belief that nothing is impossible come on are y'all hearing me nothing is impossible But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him and he got up. He wasn't in the midst of the frailing and the foaming at the mouth and out. he just, come, get up. Come on. He was not influenced by what was happening in the natural. Jesus responded he didn't respond out of the human nature side. What did Jesus always say? I say and I do what I see the Father doing. The inner dialogue. Come on, are y'all with me? That's what I'm responding to. He goes on to say, they, they begin to ask him why couldn't we cast this out? Here's what Jesus said. This only comes out with prayer and fasting. Why is that? Because prayer and fasting is what is developing our inner dialogue. Fasting is what makes your flesh scream and your spirit man come alive to be able to hear and connect with God. And yet we think fasting is just for radical people. Come on. It is amazing how many Christians don't fast. Jesus said when you fast. He didn't say if you ever. Come on. Come on. Just go without food for one day. And let your inner dialogue start talking. He who hungers and thirsts for righteousness will be filled. Jesus tells the woman, you drink of the water I give you, you'll never thirst again. Come on. Why? Because it's in here. And it's what develops the inner dialogue. Because when you drink of the Spirit, come on, you're going to want more. In the natural, you can drink water and be satisfied. But when you drink from the Spirit, you're going to want more. Oh, come on, man. And when you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you get more hungry. Why? Because the inner dialogue. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And you begin to, come on. And you begin to chew on that word. And then what that, that's that inner dialogue that begins to take place because you've been drinking from the Spirit and eating of the Word. Come on. And the outside influences do not influence you. And your inner dialogue is between you and your Father. And no matter what's going on, the confusion, come on. You're at peace. When the enemy's trying to put something on you, come on, trying to get you to accept your inner dialogue is with the Father. You're enough. Come on, man. That's the most powerful song ever. You're enough for me. You're enough for me. Acts chapter 28. Paul is on a ship. The ship wrecks. Come on. You talk about a bad day. Paul's not only on a ship that's going down. He's a prisoner on the ship. He's a prisoner on a sinking ship. And now the ship's about to run aground, and the ship runs aground, and Paul's serving, come on, 
He's over there gathering wood. And what happens? Come on, y'all know the story. He, a snake, a viper, grabs him by his hand. What does Paul do? What happens in the natural? Ooh, you are a murderer. You, you ain't escaping God's wrath. Come on, you hear the outside dialogue happening here? What does Paul do? Shook it off. Paul didn't respond to outside dialogue. Paul responded to the dialogue that was on the inside of him that all things are possible. God will finish what he started. God's called me to go here. I'm going here. And I'm going to preach the gospel here. And I'm going to, in the midst of all the confusion, all the lying, all the shipwrecks, all, come on, y'all hear what I'm saying? Paul said, and nothing happened. Why? Because Paul's inner dialogue was louder than the human nature dialogue. Man, does anybody in here... What is your inner dialogue saying? What's going on in here? Because you can be influenced by all the stuff that's going on. Do y'all hear me? Or we can believe God's word. They were all looking at Paul and waiting for him to swell up and fall over dead. What happened? The whole island gets saved. Why? Come on, man. Come on. And this gospel of the kingdom, because he knew his God, he was able to do great exploits. He was able to excel in the midst of of an abomination. Man. Y'all stand. None of this works. None of this works if one, you don't believe it. If you ain't made Jesus the Lord of your life, can't work. Because you can't hit the mark if you're not in Him. You can't hit the mark and you'll always live under a letter of death. If you don't believe and if you haven't received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Now, if you want to do that and you say, I need to change my dialogue, I need to meet you up here real quick. And we're going to pray. You say, I got to get my life right and I've got to do it today. Come on, don't even think about it. Come up here. Listen, it don't matter what anybody thinks. You're here to change your inner dialogue today. You're here to get this right. Come on. Oh, another Morgan. Praise <laughs> God. If Morgans can get saved and Hiltons can get saved, anybody can.
Come on, we're changing some things today. Hmm, just line up right there. Welcome. Welcome to the kingdom. Come on. I know you want to. And you know you want to. It's pretty simple. Today, the inner dialogue must change. Today is the day. Come on, anybody else? Everybody say this with me. Jesus, I thank you that you came and you showed me how to hit the mark. I stand here forgiven of all my sin that separated me from God and life. And I thank you, Lord, for saving me. In Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> What's your name? Caleb? Caleb. Go take your mountain, Caleb. <laughs> Study the life of Caleb and David in the Bible. How old are you? Thirteen. Thirteen. Can't think of a better way to start life at thirteen. The sky's the limit. Let me tell you something. There ain't no limit. There ain't no limit to your faith in Him. Nothing's impossible. He's going to stir some dreams and things in you. Go for it. Go for it. Man, oh man. God's good. Father, I come to you. We are inadequate in ourselves. But when our trust and our faith is in you and our belief, nothing's impossible. Jesus, you are our credentials. You are our endorsement to go out into this world to proclaim the kingdom of righteousness and the good news that you are in charge. Father, I thank you over our households. You are in charge that your rule and reign in our households far surpass any government or kingdom on this earth. Jesus, we love you. We are tied to your covenant and we thank you and we praise you for all that you're doing. I speak life, health, and healing and a refreshing in this body. And I thank you and I praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Woo, love y'all. See you Wednesday.